everyone, welcome back to the show. Uh, today's guest uh, is someone who's played a big role in my life, even though we've only interacted very few times. Uh, and I think he's played a big role in a lot of people's um, growing up in the way they view the world. So Walter, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here. All right. So for the uninitiated people who are unfamiliar with, with your body of work, who are you and what do you do? I'm Walter Schreifels. I'm a musician. I live here in New York and um, have been uh, writing songs, playing in bands, and I do production work and all kinds of stuff related to, to music. Okay. So we're going to unpack a whole bunch of stuff because you're someone that I view as being like an incredible songwriter, amazing musician. I look at your musical career as someone who's very comfortable with bringing different things to the table and disrupting. Uh-huh. But disrupting in like a cool way, not an obnoxious. And maybe you'll maybe you'll uh, uh-huh. unpack that for me more. Let's focus on songwriting. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you were doing the pre work with uh, with Spencer, the pre interview, you used a quote which is, "Boldness can be praised if it works." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if you, uh, I, I I heard like a Bowie quote recently that I thought was really good, uh, along the lines of like, when you are. Um, when you push yourself to where you're in a zone that you're uncomfortable, um, that's when you kind of create the opportunities to do something really special, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think, um, that, that sort of like uh, tentativeness I think is, uh, where really unique and special things happen. You know, if you kind of trust your sensibility and taste and, and, uh, maybe try to like jump ahead a little bit, um, from what people are doing, then people will respond. Although if there's so many ways it could go wrong, you know, like even though if the artistic idea is, is on point, it might not be appreciated until some later date. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think just with my, with my work, I've always wanted to, um, incorporate all my interests into these different things. There's like a lot I'm trying to jam into it Mm -hmm. and, um, always want to be like a little bit projecting futuristically, um, for, for me. When did that become intentional though? And to back it up, if we think of in, correct me if I'm wrong, your first band that you mm-hmm. really ever recorded with was Gorilla Biscuits, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think with the Gorilla Biscuits, it was um, more just, there was so many, the Gorilla Biscuits was the first band I did is this hardcore punk band. And was, there was a really amazing scene in New York city at that time with so many other good bands. So you really had a close proximity to other people that were doing inspiring stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think the 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 instinct to push forward was um, based on like that I had really lots of great competition to mm-hmm. like try to like uh, grab from and, uh, and and try to anticipate ahead of it. I, I wouldn't say it was like super conscious. I was really just trying to do my best uh, within a realm of like a lot of people that I respected and admired. Totally. So you came up in the scene, which is like again for and. Uh, so, you know, like people come to the podcast from all sorts of different mm-hmm. backgrounds because this is a business podcast. Yeah. But we got a ton of people from Punk and Harker who are like, I know this guy's story and uh-huh. they're psyched, but there's going to be business people listening yeah. to this. To give everyone a little background, like when Walter talks about the scene that he came up in, it's like legendary punk hardcore scene, New York full of like characters that are beyond your imagination. Yeah. Um, in that space, what you were doing, it was just natural though. It wasn't like planned out, right? Well, I mean, just as much as you were just enthusiastic, I mean, in any sort of business context, you know, there's like waves of businesses, you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, oh, there's this new drink, it's called soda. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's your like old time people. Yeah, you know I mean? Like, and and so there's like Coca-Cola, oh, that's great. And so someone will make it one that's like it. And then someone will say, mine is orange, I'm yeah. calling it orange, you know what I mean? And then that group of people that kind of solidify within that pack of people yeah maybe become the iconic members of that group um but there's a moment when there's an idea kind of uh comes together and i think it often happens in clusters of people that are either like you know obviously are sharing i mean in in my case it was like just people my age living in new york city having an interest in this like really kind of strange crappy music uh (laughs) and uh and so it really brought an interesting <laughs> cl- clique of people together that that um, uh, rubbed up the, off of each other and like uh, challenged each other and inspired and all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, as it applies to a sort of, um, you know, it was not a business thing at that time, but I think there's a lot of businesses that don't necessarily intend 
for, you know, they don't lead with the business thing. Yeah. It's like when it becomes a business that they like, oh crap, we're making money. Now we've got to do it differently. Dude, totally. And <clears throat> this is like why I was so interested in us having this conversation. What you did led you to become a, a professional mm -hmm. musician and, and working within music professionally. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't what like you set out to do. You mm -hmm. were just some kid who was hanging out with his friends, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the music that I was putting my energy into was like very similar to like kids putting energy into skateboarding. It right. wasn't like, of course, you wanted to do well within the people that were like in your little s circle, but it wasn't like you're looking at you know, making it in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't really anybody to point to for the kind of music that I was making that would be like, yeah, I'm going to do it like that. Um, so yeah, that kind of just evolved into something where, you know, it was growing. And, um, and then, you know, I wasn't quick to, um, to necessarily maximize those, mm -hmm. those, uh, those things, those opportunities that were, that were kind of opening. But, um, we were very, I think, uh, sharp in knowing our audiences, mm -hmm. our audience and having a very shared sensibility with them and like what would go well and what would like not go well. And that's like, um, you know, the kind of messages in your songs, the kind of how they're structured, but, uh, on a business sense, like the, the, you know, like what kind of t-shirts do you put out? Like, what do you, what, what kind of, what's the price? Who do you associate with? What values are you uh, projecting? Uh, these are things I think businesses are thinking about a lot these days. And I, I would even draw the line to not like myself, but to like people like myself mm -hmm. or that you're doing a business podcast, pe people like you as well, mm -hmm. that learned a lot of these um ways of uh, of uh, running an, an organization a business and how you stay attuned to your audience and understand you know your audience your consumer blah blah blah, blah. um same thing you learn um how to how to manage all these different components within within an organization uh and how to work with people and you get make a lot of shortcuts in, in that kind of diy excuse me diy realm um because you realize you don't need permission for a lot of things. You can just kind of bootstrap a lot of things. Well, I love that idea of not asking for permission. Like I, for me, the most liberating idea of punk and hardcore is like, oh, like you can just you can just go and do this thing. Yeah. Like if we think of Discord, it's like, oh, records, we want to do that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, let's just do it and not relying on a pre-existing system. But also not you're not like fighting against the system. You're just choosing to not interact with it, but yeah. yet do do the same thing in your own little microcosm. Yeah, because I think if it, there's certain industries that are like, yeah, they're they're very set in their ways. They've existed for a time, um, and they kind of get their their system works for them. Mm -hmm. But when uh, you know, obviously, the record industry, the music industry is, is constantly in flux, and people are really like always trying to figure out a new way to like make that connection between the artist and the audience. Um, and uh, I think it, in a nice way, it's kind of shifted more towards like, let's make sure the, let, let's take care of the artist first because the artist isn't getting paid, then we got nothing. Yeah, yeah, You know, in my, I think that was true with the initial hardcore kind of thing and hardcore music is the kind of music that I was making. Mm -hmm. But it was very much like, it was still like a, a more of a commune kind of idea, uh, I think, where there's uh, the guy that's putting out the records, the guy that's making the T-shirts, the guy that's playing the bass, the guy that's like dancing in the audience, uh, the guy that's like booking the shows or whatever, that these all these different components were like uh, part of the same machine yeah. in a way. Um, uh, so... In your bands, you mm -hmm. kind of unintentionally take on took on the leadership role. It wasn't mm -hmm. like I'm going to be like the band dad yeah. or be yeah. this person. You just kind of fell into it. How did that happen? I think, uh, yeah, absolutely, was not like trying to be like I'm leading this thing, man. Yeah. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? I mean, I have been in, sort of in that role, but I mean, just because uh, I I got it, I figured out how to write songs, yeah. and like I got in, interested in it, and then because I was doing that, that just like that's the, the sort of the, you know, I'm just going to say in business speak, but like, that's the, what we're selling. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like that, that's, th that's the major point of it. You know what I mean? Obviously like we're selling t-shirts, we're selling when we're playing live, we're getting paid for that. Um, and there's just the, each one of those kind of realms is, uh, you know, selling the records, like where are they distributed? Who's getting it? Who's, is it, it's getting a proper amount of coverage in, in, you know, 
in that time it would have been fanzines, but like media coverage, et cetera, who's responsible for that. So it, 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 it fans out, but it starts with the songs. And because I was writing the songs and, uh, and organizing that part of it for the most part, I ended up not in all ways. I mean, I was very happy to take back seats when I wasn't my department, you know? Um, but in the ways that I was leading, it was, that was where it was coming from. So at what point <clears throat> did you become conscious of like, Oh, actually I can't, I want to like take a leap creatively or I want to get uncomfortable. So for example, Gorilla Biscuits demo to mm -hmm. the, to the EP, mm -hmm. there's a, a pretty clear line of how that progressed. Mm -hmm. The LP came out and I remember as a kid getting it and being like, well, this is Gorilla Biscuits, mm -hmm. but this is like, this is a much bigger thing. It, it, it it's a, it's like getting a comic book mm -hmm. and then getting a novel. It's oh, just cool. like a different mm -hmm. a different thing, but it kept that through line. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious decision to really up your game as a songwriter and to, and to do what the band could do, or did it just kind of happen? I mean, yeah, I definitely wanted to make it great, you yeah. know, and I think it was timed nicely to where like uh, the the whole band, we were just like, our identity was getting more solid. We were gaining more confidence. I was getting more confidence about what I was doing and our energy was really good to where like anything that we did within the group of, uh, of the five of us at that time was like the, the, uh, you know, any idea was going to get bounced around or made fun of in a good way. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So where you have like a good team. So like, uh, it allows people to feel supported and, uh, you know, I felt like I was a great songwriter because those guys were treating me that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that it, it, it sort of becomes more real in that way. And if you wanted to do something like, I never felt that our band, because I was cramming all these different influences into it, you know, you have some of the the major bands in in the in, in our realm. Like, I didn't think we were measured up on a lot of different things, mm -hmm. um, but we did well at being us yeah, yeah. and i think that that's really the what you have to offer the world is like be really good at being who you are yeah that's tough though and so mm -hmm. i want to i want to break that into two things because i do want to push on the idea of like innovating mm -hmm. and again when i say the 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 demo to the uh, seven inch it was a, a clear progression mm -hmm. when i call it a comic book i mean a cool comic book yeah. where you're like i'm mm -hmm. into that yeah the difference between those two and the LP is significant. Mm. It's a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. And it felt like someone really put their hands on the wheel and was like, no, nah, I'm going to kind of drive this thing. It had mm. that feel to it. Mm -hmm. What's the trust involved with getting people to be like, okay, we're just going to go with you. You got the bigger idea. Like, how do you get that kind of trust with people? And was there ever any like pushback from, from people in the band saying like, geez, are we going to put harmonica on this? That sounds like wild. Uh, not really. There was never a hard thing. I think I just was after, you know, going from our demo, which was really me like trying to figure out this whole thing that I, you know, I was new to this kind of music and new to being in a band and all that kind of stuff. And just being like parts of it were good to this like seven inch. You said that our first comic is a solid comic book. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, now we are, now we've got an audience, you know, now we can play for an audience. The audience is going to respond. So you're learning from, you know, what would be a business. You're, you're, I'm just going to keep calling it your audience, yeah. like the people that care about your thing that, that when they're coming back to you, even if it's like all positive, you're still soaking up that energy of like why it's good, what's working within it. Mm -hmm. um, and so going at the album, um, I was better, more confident and, um, and as that playing that role within the band, uh, the other guys were supportive because I was always like, I also understood like as I was writing things, like I understood what my bandmates would do because they're all have a personality as performers themselves, yeah. as, as, as artists themselves. And so like, I know that this is going to work because I, I just got to, I just know how well this person is at that. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to lift my idea to another place. And then if you say, let's put a harmonica, it makes perfect sense. And if it was dumb or didn't work, we wouldn't have left it on. I mean, there's probably some ideas that we tried that were just like too, I don't, I don't remember what they were, mm -hmm. but it was like, we were actively searching for things to sort of make it a little bit crazier, yeah. you know, because I, I think with, with that album and it's maybe it's not like a general business thing. It's more of like an actual talking about a, a, a record. It's like you have this sort of expectation uh, based on the, 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 
the thing itself, you know, like you said, the, what you've heard up till that time. So you have a basic projection in your mind of what the next thing is going to be. Um, and then how that fits into the larger context of like other bands or other groups of people trying to do the same thing. And um, fucking with that as much as you can while still delivering the core thing. So it's like the songs had all the things that you would want, but like wherever there was an opportunity to do something sort of ridiculous or or, or you know make a squiggly line here or something like that to to show that we're not that we have that confidence yeah. like we're not worried that if we put a harmonic on this record that people are gonna be like oh man that's so uncool it's so <laughs> lame like if you're gonna have the reaction to it then it's like that's just you're a little uptight and i think it's like you're probably gonna loosen up eventually <laughs> totally. or maybe never and that's fine too but if that's the de- point of departure like okay good we can live with that it's harmonica for you and good luck <laughs> with your thing but i, I but doing those kind of things within that context mm-hmm. you know and and i you i think that's why people love artists is like when you have that idea of what's coming next mm-hmm. and they play with that expectation yeah. while still delivering something that is like uh, you know authentic yeah. to, to to their their journey you know Dude that this is exactly and so when i think of businesses um i would just did an interview a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. for this business blog and they said what advice would you have for any small business some someone starting something mm-hmm. and i was like don't pay any attention to your competitors mm-hmm. at all mm-hmm. so when i started my company i literally had no idea who my competitors were i knew one company which mm-hmm. is the company i'd been at before mm-hmm. and i had this like burning desire to do something way cooler than them mm-hmm. but i didn't like keep up with what they were doing yeah nor did i ever research what other people were doing and when when i was asked why i was like because i'm not trying to be derivative of someone else mm-hmm. i'm not trying to do like a oh like us too like our company has this i was like that's fine i want to be totally standalone i want to be completely mm-hmm. unique in doing that though you've got to be able to like you got to have the goods so Mm -hmm. you can be yourself and totally suck and your band could suck, your business could suck. But if you've got that thing, then you should be able to pull it off. Going back to Gorilla Biscuits and I'm going to step into, into uh, Moondog and then quicksand from there. Um, Gorilla Biscuits 100% is like a unique band. And I'd say there's never been another Gorilla Gorilla Mm -hmm. Biscuits. Youth of Today, which is, of course, one of my all-time favorite mm-hmm. bands, or like a band like Minor Threat. There's mm-hmm. never been another band like them, yeah. but you could see people being like iterations of those bands yeah. or derivative of those yeah. bands. I can't think of a band that's really like derivative of Gorilla Biscuits yeah. in a way that's like really close. Yeah. Kind of like Dag Nasty. I don't think mm-hmm. there's ever been someone who's super close to Dag yeah, Nasty. Yeah. Um, being that unique means you're, you've got a legacy and something that lasts, mm-hmm. but is there any uh, negative side to that? Is it have people, do people ever react negatively to Gorilla Biscuits being so unique, so different than their peers? I think probably if you look at fanzines at the time, you know, you probably find some people that are salty about one thing or another, but I think over time, like, you know, and, and the audience for people that don't know about hardcore, it's a real salty audience to begin with. It's a lot of salt in it just from it's one of the main ingredients. Oof, totally. uh, so, uh, so, you know, that's just going to happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, but again, it was like just like what the rationale was for it mm-hmm. was, you know, I, I could have had I could have had some concerns like, oh, damn it, you know being hard like in hardcore is like kind of part of the thing and it's like we're not really like hard hard Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like because our lyrics are all just uplifting Mm -hmm. and um i just was confident about what we were doing i thought we had made like a really you know i was really happy with with pretty much every aspect of it i think it just had a lot of joy in it Mm -hmm. and um and was unique to us Mm -hmm. and uh you know just the name the whole thing is just kind of like uh ha- has that it was just something cool so i appreciated it as it was happening and like i thought we had made a great album and so there was yeah maybe some reviews like oh this is blah 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 or that's this i don't like this the aspect of it and uh you know that could may or may have not annoyed me at the time but i was very confident that we had made something you know we had made a great album i, I thought for sure so gorilla biscuits <clears throat> It's like your first space of really being like, oh, I'm actually like a songwriter. I mm. can do this thing mm-hmm. and I'm going to be unique. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be innovative. Mm-hmm. And when I said right at the beginning of the interview, I view you as a disruptor because I think you're someone, not think, I firmly believe mm-hmm. you're someone who's like, oh, I'm going to take a leap and try something mm-hmm. new. 
and then people follow. Mm. I heard someone said to, just the other day, a great business leader was like, oh, disruption is when you do something that's not easily uh, imitatable mm -hmm. and, and everyone spends years trying to copy that. Mm -hmm. And finally someone gets it down the line, yeah. but you're already onto the next thing. Yes. That is exactly how I viewed uh, your musical career. Yeah. So hitting with grilled biscuits, you get to this kind of like peak. Yeah. And then the next thing that happens is Moondog into quicksand. Yeah. What caused that shift? I think um, some of it's like kind of unique to the kind of scene we're in. There wasn't really a lot of like um, long career arcs mm -hmm. in, in our scene. And I think it was also corresponding with like me getting good at – or, or gaining confidence in like songwriting, although I still didn't necessarily see myself as a songwriter. I wanted to create things yeah. that would happen. And um, so, you know, I had, uh, I start. I wanted to sing because I was working with, um, with Siv from Gorilla Biscuits, like on singing, like me and Don Fury, we were like, and Siv, we'd all work together on the vocals and like really get into it. And, um, and that was a really, really fun process. But uh, I felt like, why don't I just sing and do it the way that I want to do and see what it sounds like? And no one knows what I sing like. So if it's bad, no one will care. And if it's good, it'll be surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to hear it anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I surely was not wanting to, um, I think at that time, the, the, the like once th there is a sort of understanding of how a thing is done, and uh, I think like we were talking about Youth Today, for example, I think Youth Today is really, really a great thing because uh, for many different reasons. One of it is it's like sort of like Black Sabbath, like you can pick the cues and take the parts. And that's what I did. You know, being in Youth Today, I was definitely like stealing parts, yeah. you know, for what I was doing with Gorilla Biscuits because uh, it's that kind of a, of a, of a thing. Um, uh, so, but at a certain stage, like too many people had the blueprints. Yeah. And it was just sort of like, I didn't, it wasn't interesting me anymore. Uh, I didn't feel that peer group that I felt maybe a couple years before, like that were like, um, and, and what you said, I think is very true. Like, don't try to like pay too much attention to your peers, but if your peers are inspiring you and, and, and are egging you to be compete, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, and maybe that's a bad way to put it. Like, um, but it's more like someone says something funny or interesting mm -hmm. you know that inspires you to maybe like get in, into that conversation you know what i mean and uh, it, it felt, felt a little flat so i just wanted to like um throw different ingredients in and things that were like maybe um less uh more uh discordant and like uh and just like a little change to the formula mm -hmm. like little changes to the formula was enough to do something sort of drastic to where the feedback was again really good and i think it was a mixture of that sort of like, oh, this isn't, I don't like this. But you just knew that it was the people that were like bugging on it were going to be the the, the, lar the louder voice. Yeah. I, I want to hit on two things you said. Do you mind if we talk about competition for a second? Sure. Um, so if you're playing a show and you're headlining mm -hmm. and the band before you crushes it, mm -hmm. they're awesome. Mm -hmm. Would you, like, do you want to go in and be like, okay, we'll just phone it in or does that make you go harder? Damn. I mean, you don't want to look thirsty, you know, right. trying to like chase anybody. Right. Um, and I, I don't, I, I think I'm past the point of like, if someone's really, really good. Yeah. I'm inspired by that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't think it's bad to be uh, competitive in, in it if you care about what you're doing, yeah. because like, it's not competitive to beat them or take something from them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's to, uh, it's to, to move it forward and to, uh, you know, um, reinterpret because everybody's like people are reinterpreting. I mean, I'm not like big, I don't want to be big headed about it in any way, but there are some people that are reinterpreting what I do, Totally, man. but they should know that I'm just reinterpreting what someone else did. <laughs> and like, I'm failing at like ripping them off by creating this other thing that just sounds slightly wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and and some of that's really obvious, you know what I mean. At times, you know, and 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 uh, and I'm not like ashamed of that. It's no. just the way that it is. It's like we're always imprinting. You're born. You like you're this little blob. Someone tells you you're a person. You're imprinting off your parents. You're mm -hmm. imprinting off of your siblings or whatever. It's just like that's what life is, you know. Uh, well, someone that I learned. One of the people that I learned the most about from song about songwriting from was Todd Jones. Mm -hmm. And Todd Jones, one day, I was like. Damn, I'm having a really hard time coming up with something. And he was like, oh, um, 
then just sent me a song and he's like, play this riff backwards. Mm -hmm. I was like, can I do that? He was like, oh, that's like all, every single song I start with taking a riff that I like and twisting it or moving it in Mm -hmm. some way. And it was kind of like someone gave me the keys where I was like, yeah, like, you know, great things come from like not being derivative, but like iteration and creating new things and bringing all the different influences. Uh, it was one of the most, he'd probably laugh if he heard this. He was, they might be like, don't tell people my secret. But mm-hmm. like, that's what, it was a game changer thing for me rather than sitting in my bedroom and like pounding my guitar away yeah. and just feeling like this sucks. To be like, oh, go with something that's inspiring. Yeah. Just don't be derivative of it. Yeah. Uh, going back to competition. Listen, I am a firm believer that there's toxic competition where it's just like shitty. You're jealous. You're angry. You yeah. want to win so other people lose. Yeah. And then there's super cool competition, which I believe you were talking about in the early days of the yeah. scene that you were part of, where yeah. people inspire you. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. And yeah. in fact, I want to like up the game. I want to take it up a few notches. Healthy, positive competition is what I believe is about making the world better in general, mm-hmm. and not just like music or art or business, but like, oh, like, hey, what a great community program they've got over there. Mm-hmm. I actually kind of want to make an even better version of that. Yeah. That in its base level is an idea of like, I want to iterate on that and make it stronger, more powerful, have my voice a part of it. Yeah. That's competition. Yeah. Competition is nothing wrong. The seed is in competition with the soil around it. I think that's totally cool. Yeah. Um, going to um, not paying attention to people versus like paying attention because people inspire you. I, I'm a firm believer in hanging out with people who um, are good at the things that you want to be good at. Yeah, I mean, you're learning from people. I I mean, I feel like, uh, yeah, I mean, that competitiveness, uh, you know, just it's just like there's, yeah, there's a childish version of that, especially if you're talking about art, though. I mean, it's like, you know, what what drove all these, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones? Obviously, the Beatles, the the Rolling Stones are chasing the Beatles for a long time, and off to great effect, you yeah. know, it's like they're ripping off the Beatles and yet I love this because they're doing it. Um, you know, they're doing it. They have something inherently good in what they're doing that just works yeah. in this context. And then eventually leads to them just being like, okay, we've covered that base and now we're going to get into some other sort of thing. And I think, um, and also I think it's good in any sort of like, you know, again, bringing it back to like a business idea is like to understand the conversation that's going on, I think is helpful. Like if you're getting into anything like, oh yeah, you know, I would like to be, um, you know, open, you know, business X or whatever. It's better. It's good to at least know what the other people are doing. So you have some people that you admire, mm. you know, cause then you can create, I mean, uh, a sort of taste you know, in, in something. And then when people are talking about it, like you get the references and you can, you can understand the subtleties within something to like why you decide to include, you know, some sort of cliche or, or not, or twist it. You know what I mean? Because there are structures that, you know, exist in musical styles in, uh, any sort of product, you know what I mean? Like, uh, a sneaker, uh, you know, d- d- streetwear styles you know what i mean certain colors are going to come to the fore and like uh, certain trends are going to play out and i think if you're following i think it behooves you if you're going to like invest your time and money in like trying to be an entre- any sort of entrepreneurial effort um it behooves you to understand the sort of the lay of the land yeah. and also to like have some people that you like love and some people that you just like think are doing it wrong as hell so that you like can feel that vibe, you know, and, and, um, but yeah, if you, I I think anybody initially getting into something is going to be, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with it is like, you're going to like, just try to like imitate the people that you think are cool. Yeah. But, but at some point there's going to be someone else that's like kind of on your, on your, your plane, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you'll notice what they're doing. They'll notice what you're doing. And like, then it comes down to person, you know, personality and luck and context and all these kind of things. I remember like, Sick of it all's demo was just so goddamn good. It was just like our demo is like sucks compared to this thing, man. And I just, you know, just wanted to get to that point where we could do something that sounded that together. Mm-hmm. And that drove me to um work harder at it and just like figure out how to do it. But it was just never a thing of like there's nothing to take away from Sick of It All. Just I love them. I was a fan. Yeah. So that's inspiring. I think that's how it always 
kind of works. I believe surrounding yourself by successful people, and I don't mean monetarily, but yeah. just in whatever pursuit. So someone who's a great parent, like mm -hmm. I have, um, we have like a young daughter. Mm -hmm. I love being around people who are great parents who are mm -hmm. like really plugged into their kids' lives. Mm -hmm. It's super inspiring to me. It mm -hmm. makes me better at what I do. Yeah. Um, I'm not competing with them. I'm like trying to learn from them. Uh, I spend, exactly. I spend I'm, a lot of time with like business mentors, people who have been successful. Again, not in like whether or not they've made a ton of money, mm -hmm. but like there's a, a company in um, started in BC, uh, an insurance company, and the CEO is someone that I've like befriended, and they're like big company. Mm -hmm. But he's just it's a family owned company, and he's just a cool dude, and mm -hmm. he stayed a cool dude. And the company as as an as a outcrop of that is just like a real company. Mm -hmm. And you might think of insurance and be like, oh, insurance, that's lame. Right. But it's like, well, literally, your guitar probably has insurance. Like, mm -hmm. and I would rather be involved in business with that has heart and has good people involved mm -hmm. in it than just like whatever insurance company. Mm -hmm. um, surrounding yourself with good people who are like good at what you want to be good at, I think is like the most important yeah. thing to like upping your game constantly. Absolutely. Going back to quicksand. Um, so you make this shift, you're doing a different thing. Cause there's a big difference between mm -hmm. grilled biscuits and, mm -hmm. and quicksand, yeah. but the songwriting sensibility is there, but it's upped mm -hmm. very specifically the bass the, the bass intro and in, into in a mission mm -hmm. from when it starts to when everything kicks in, it screws with my head every single time. Yeah. I don't understand how you wrote that. Cause it's just like in the middle of the phrase. Yes. So, but it was not anything that's, um, like, I don't like we we're talk talking about people like I listen it, quicksand. I always think Jawbox. like how did Jawbox figure out these like cool tricks or like Fugazi do it too. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, it's like, I wish I could figure out those cool tricks. The cool tricks that come for me are, are just like they just happen. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, and maybe that's how it happened for those guys too. It probably is, but I, I picture them with like you know all these schematics and like you know, <laughs> you know like bulletin boards. Like how do they build this key change or whatever? But uh, yeah, something like that. Just um, you know, and and again, it's playful too because it's um, it is it, although there's a darkness to it it's like playing off of the brightness of of gorilla biscuits mm -hmm. in a way but it, it's also um playful because it's uh it's not labored over really too much and um and it's just like playing with your expectations you know yeah. uh i thought that that people who liked gorilla biscuits might be tripped out by it but in a good way right right and if i was wrong no one would care so it would be fine totally <laughs> So you're like, you've got the the liberty of putting out this record. Just start with Moondog, going mm -hmm. to Quicksand. Mm -hmm. You've got the liberty of doing it because you've also got a following. People believe in you. You've mm -hmm. got a good group of people around you. You've got a record label that believes in you as mm -hmm. a good friend. Then you sign to a major. Mm -hmm. At what point does music become a business for you? And I don't mean the negative connotation, but what at what point do you guys have to start treating it like a business? Yeah, I mean, certainly at that time because there's... Um and we were still pretty young, but I mean, it, it was, there's just more money being handled. And so you had to, there was taxes and stuff like that, that were, you know, we were selling t-shirts, but we were selling them out of the van and just like collecting cash and like splitting it up at the end of the night. You know what I mean? There was no accounting, there was no record of it or anything like that. So, uh, fortunately in quicksand, we had, uh, our drummer, Alan was like very on point with that kind of stuff. And he, and I think most bands you get four people, it's usually the drummer actually, um, someone will get on point with that and recognize it as a business. And then we got, we ended up with a really, you know, typical st structure at the time, you know, we had a manager, uh, we have an accountant, uh, we have a lawyer, um, and, uh, you know, a booking agent and, uh, you know, all these different people that are involved in, um, moving it forward, having it be more successful, sh uh, saving money where we can save it, uh, and making sure we don't get in trouble with the government and, uh, and that our people that are, you know, at that time it was the record label, you know, are that where our relationships are good because they are the source of our, um, ability to go out on tour, to make records because we've signed this agreement with them. So that doesn't mean they're just, it's all on our terms. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a relationship as well to make sure those relationships are good. Um, and that we're, uh, plugged into the right people that can help us at a larger spot. So those, those kind of business things, uh, came more into my realm, but, it was still at that point, there was a structure of like adults mm -hmm. 
that kind of were able to uh, and and with our guy Allen who was very much uh, watching those guys. Yeah. You know what I mean in in an, in a in a helpful way. So something Chris Wren from Bridge Nine said to me that I thought was like really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't take a salary from Bridge Nine. I don't even know if he does now. Mm -hmm. He makes his living off Sully's, off his t-shirt company. Mm -hmm. And I asked why, like, why don't you go all, all in on Bridge Nine? Um, he said, once the thing that you're passionate about becomes how you make your living, it interferes with the choices that you make. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Um, I mean, I guess at that point I was frustrated with um, that this system, you know, you have this major label system and, you know, we, I think we're kind of hitting on this a little bit earlier, but like the major label system had evolved over years and, um, you know, was working for them, yeah. but I saw nothing but waste yeah. within it because, uh, you know, we had made a record for like $2,000 or, you know, $1,500, some like crazy, like not $3,000 yeah. and had sold, you know, 10, 15,000 copies of this thing. And now here we are to make our album and we can't make it for like less than like a quarter million of dollars. And like, I just don't understand why that is yeah. like, uh, like they wanted you to, they, you want, you're contracted, like the numbers are big in this realm. So you have to spend that money and you're, it's not like they just give it to you. Like, hey, this back in like six months with the album. It's like, no, they're involved. They're yeah. following their investment. Yeah. And, um, you know, to my mind is like, okay, we spent $2,000 on the last one. That was three songs. So, let's just say we spend uh, $10,000 on this one, like tons of other bands in our same position uh, will be doing this year. Yeah. Um, and then we just keep that money. You, you can put part of it in something that you want to do, but like, why are we just burning all this money? And um, so that was kind of crazy to me, but um, you know, there was reasons for it. Mm -hmm. And um, now that that major list label system is kind of broken down in a lot of ways, I'm I can there's a certain sadness that I have because like while like that money would have been so much I think better spent in a way, mm -hmm. it also kept this whole system going, which means that like people had jobs, mm -hmm. you know. So so I can see it kind of from both angles, but um, we had people that were you know respected in pros within the business like navigating that for us mm -hmm. and um you know i think i really kind of got it more to a business when i started to like fall out of that system mm -hmm. because then it's just like me like how am i going to do this mm -hmm. and like uh once i kind of saw that okay this is not like a fluke like this is what i do yeah uh, that's exactly where i want to go yeah um so quicksand uh you talk to one person that might be like oh yeah quicksand was a cool band like mm -hmm. definitely a cool band mm -hmm. but i loved gorilla biscuits or mm -hmm. i've loved what walter's gone on mm -hmm. to do other people are like oh quicksand is like the most pivotal band in alternative music mm -hmm. and we'll like take that stand on it mm -hmm. um ups and downs with that band big time yeah. so i want to talk about the leadership role of like mm -hmm. how do you when you've got something that is at that inflection point where culture is changing and you're part of that culture yeah. change and it starts wearing down on the people. So from a leadership perspective, what were you doing or what were you learning about keeping a group of people focused and together during that time? Yeah, I mean, I think I probably could have done better. I mean, I think it was at, at the time that we were doing this, you know, I was at, you know, I was in my 20s and kind of dealing with a lot of stuff. And I just kind of took a more personal look at like what was going on and what the stresses of, um, you know, this, the, the, the stresses of doing it the way that we were doing it, which was very, you know, we were playing like 300 dates a year. That's crazy. Which is nuts. And, um, you know, this is all encompassing to my life. And um, there was just, eventually, I think everyone was just kind of a little mentally worn out. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have thought that our structure could have like filled that, some of those, and they, you know, and they did and people tried in a ways. I think now, like, um, having had that experience and maybe like, uh, uh, ha you know, g having all kinds of experiences in life to, to, to have a better handle on it. Um, I think there's like just communication that probably could have, as a leader, mm -hmm. probably would have been better to say, Hey guys, let's take a break yeah. because we're starting to, um, go after each other on things that aren't really, um, as big of issues that we're making them out to be. And, uh, and not seeing really like, we're just under a lot of stress or like, this isn't like, that our, our, our 
sort of vibe is getting knocked off by the fact that we're just like completely tethered to this to the road yeah and yeah. and we need to like get away and appreciate like what we're doing a little bit to, to rather than being like in it so much well like the <clears throat> retrospectively like when i look at gorilla biscuits it looks like a bunch of young kids friends mm -hmm. who just kind of grew up together mm -hmm. just growing up together like playing music growing up together mm -hmm. quicksand um i believe you were all like friends when you started the band right I was closest with with Tom, the guitar player, and um, I lived with Alan, but we weren't like super tight. Like we were just, you know, roommates. Hey, man, how you doing? Sergio, I didn't really know. Um, I thought it was cool because I think Tom and Alan were really just great musicians. I thought of our of our crew that I knew, mm -hmm. and uh, and Sergio was someone new that I hadn't played with, and added like some other kind of like element um that uh played a sort of x factor you know like where in, in uh saying we were talking about gorilla biscuits earlier like you know i was very plugged into how everyone played and we were very like in the same uh you know had same times you were all that kind of stuff like that going into quicksand it wasn't like that like you know even alan and tom they were in the same band they were like they already had beef yeah, yeah. you know what i mean when they came <laughs> into quicksand so um so you basically had, you know, me and Tom were pretty tight, you know, and eventually we all became tight, yeah. but our chemistry spoke very immediately, totally. you know what I mean? And I think like everyone, um, knew that, yeah. like, you know, and I think a lot of times, I mean, I've really mostly experienced with music, but you know, with everything, when something just clicks, it clicks. Well, very specific to that. What's more important? And I know you're going to want to say both are important, mm -hmm. but like, which has more weight? the ability to come together and, and really click and create something or mm -hmm. the ability to come to, to come together and like hang and be, and be good with each other. I think they're both important aspects, you know? And, and I think what's more important is like recognizing that, mm -hmm. you know, um, and giving people respect mm -hmm. and trust. I think that goes such a long way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a tendency when something, especially when there's like when you got geniuses in your band, you know what I mean? Like people that are really have a vision have like a way that they they could steer the thing as well as you could mm. um that you uh you show respect and show trust i think there's a, sometimes it'll be like more like uh you know people try to cut each other down break each other down a little bit and by breaking someone else down like um you know that can work for a while maybe you'll just like sap the fun out of it for that person and they'll just do it because uh, they need the money or they don't know what else to do or blah, 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 blah. But you've just like cut off a source of potential coolness yeah. uh, before they were annoying to you. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the way that you get someone to, you know, someone's annoying to you it has something to do with them, but it also has a lot to do with you, why someone's annoying you. And like you have a lot more control of how that works. And my experience over time is like, you know, communication, but also just like listening to people, you know what I mean? Listening to people, listening to their ideas, working through their ideas, getting on the same page on those things. Cause like when someone listens to me, um, like, or, or, or anybody, you know, it's like you, you, you appreciate that, you know, you feel heard. And if it's not like if they didn't like really want to pick up what you're laying down, but it's done with respect and with trust and you have like a track record like that, then you're going to get the best out of people. And, and they're going to be, they're going to do the same for you. And then you have like a, a functioning thing. I'm not saying that that's like, you know, I would be down for like a benevolent dictator. Like if they were crushing calls, like, yeah. you know what I mean? If you're coming with a hot, a hot hand and you're doing it, you know, there's no need to be abusive about it, yeah. but you know what I mean? But I, I, I will bow, I'm, I'll do it. You know, like with youth today, it's like, Ray's got a hot hand, you yeah. know what I mean? He's he's the man, so I will always defer to his vision, even if it's like, I don't know, man, but let's roll, you know? Um, and, you know, to, working from that point where, you know, Ray was the, the, the definitive leader of the band, he was very good at, like, opening up channels, yeah. you know, to, like, get the best out of me. Yeah. How important is uh, humility and the in the ability? And it's kind of a loaded question because yeah. it's obviously important. Yeah. But like, again, for the audience, for audience who hasn't been here, uh, Gorilla Biscuits and uh, Youth of Today were contemporaries mm -hmm. and both like massively 
uh, impactful bands mm -hmm. for many, many people. Mm -hmm. In Gorilla Biscuits, you were clearly like everyone would matter in the band, but you were like the creative center of the, mm -hmm. of the band. In Youth of Today, mm -hmm. you you played a supporting role. Yeah. So how did you manage both of those things to be able to like really know how to play the right role in the band and like keep whole while you did it? Yeah, I think that was a good a good experience for me because being in Youth Today, like I felt like Ray's really got a vision and I trust trust his vision, mm -hmm. but he also opened up a lane for me to like improve upon it. And so he got my best, he got the best out of me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that works. I don't think that was a scheme. I think he just saw like, um, that he had, he had good people to work with. But I think like now I think more of in those kind of, those kind of terms, you know, like sometimes you could get, I think maybe at, at a younger age, it'd be like a zero sum. You know what I mean? It's like, my idea is great. Your idea is sucks mm -hmm. and i will crush you to like eliminate your <laughs> idea like oh if it has to be through you know whatever kind of i will do it mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh because you'll ruin it yeah, you yeah, know what yeah. i mean and even if when you win those battles you don't really win because you build resentment yeah um and i think that that'll kind of come and get you eventually and uh and and and, and not only from that person but you're also your own mo kind of gets clouded by that so I, I i think that's some people are just wired uh you know have a better sense of that like from the jump i had to kind of like learn it and uh you know it's also important to be be firm when when something should ha be one way or the other yeah. and and uh you ha do have to make those calls and sacrifices like mm -hmm. it's important that you're down to do that but i think if you're working in a group you need you need to you know, uh, engage them and, and show them respect and give them opportunities because that's what people want. People are there. They want to, they want to give. So your career continues. Quicksand has, uh, puts out two LPs. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some clear challenges cause the band's kind of like, seems to be like kind of emerging and disappearing and emerging and disappearing. Uh -huh. And you make the shift into rival schools mm -hmm. and eventually into more solo work. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the ability to keep it as a living when that, when you made that shift. I mean, I think at that point, like the, when quicksand broke up, the record label picked up my contract. Mm -hmm. So I had a solo contract and, um, but and no, were you the only person in the I band? Was, I was the only one that got picked up. So I had a contract, but no band. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of cool, but kind of weird because then I had to like create some sort of thing and I had to kind of fill it into a, a they had already paid for it. So there was no, this sort of like, you know, especially in music business is like, you're trying to get the band right. and then you got the band. You're so happy. It's like, they already had me. Right. So it's like, um, yeah, you know, send us some songs, uh, let us, uh, we're going to get, we'll get around to it. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it was sort of a weird Thing because like it's cool to be on a major label and my you know I wasn't like getting ahead but my bills were paid I didn't have to like um, uh, do things like I didn't have to really have to hustle for money really yeah uh, but it you know kind of got shoestringy after a while and I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I was artistically thriving because I was just sort of on hold mm -hmm. and so I wasn't really connecting with my audience anymore um, so I think that was kind of a tough little slog for me but uh luckily it kind of i merged with uh with rival schools and with a whole new record company and uh you know because these things get bought out and it's, it's a major company so everyone gets fired and then a new wave of people come in and they all get fired and so now i finally like everything's together yeah. and um yeah i mean i was seeing it as like i mean i was kind of getting used to this in a way like I've just uh maybe rival schools was the first time i started to say like okay this is really w who i am and what i do Right. You know, I, I started to connect it more to my, like, what I do as, as a profession. Yeah. So how did that change your approach to doing it, though, both creatively and from a business aspect? Um, I think more on an artistic side, not on a business side. I think it was maybe uh, after that, because I think 
I was still just more, it was more about the music and the art for, for me, like um, really seeing it as like, these are my creative things or not, they're not mine solely. Like I'm working with people that are also contributing and doing great stuff and lifting, but like, I'm still that force behind it, especially like when it's my contract, blah, blah, blah. So um, I started to accept that more. And then I think after Rival Schools, I was like, again, open to be like, um, I was still fo fo focused on the music actually, but um, I guess I started to get, make sense of it more as a business because my next project wasn't on a major label. So then the money started to count more. Yeah, yeah. And so I had to like look at that a little bit more closely. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm like, uh, I'm still not like, um, I, it's just a larger concern. Like, and I think it just starts, you just start to get more of a ratio of like, what is, what is my time? Like, is this thing that I'm doing, uh, going to benefit me on a creative level? Um, is it going to bring, bring me around people that I think are interesting or going to, going to lift me? Uh, and, uh, if it pays, like what, what, it, how is that significant? And is it like, vir you know, sort of a cost benefit analysis. I get a little bit more, um, clued into, um, rival schools, like mm -hmm. cool, very cool chapter mm -hmm. in, in, in what you did bringing me to what I think are two super as a, as your audience, as part mm -hmm. of your audience, two super interesting things. Um, <clears throat> I've always considered you to be a person who's always moving forward mm -hmm. and expanding mm -hmm. your ability to create and bring more stuff into your, into what you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have, I think, I, I say this often about Sick of It All. Sick of It All was one of the first bands who learned how to how to like really be a hardcore band mm -hmm. professionally and still be cool. Yeah, um, I think you're one of the the uh, originators of someone who came from the punk scene and stayed cool. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't, you know, you I didn't do. become like a a wild like weird caricature of yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you stayed cool. So you've always been moving forward, and then comes reunions mm -hmm. and. I don't know if you've ever, if you had this feeling, but I remember as a kid growing up, I was like, I don't want to see a reunion. Like that sucks. It's like yeah. a sellout. It's yeah. like, you know, yeah. it's, it's bullshit. And when bands would do it, I'd always be like, I'm not going to yeah. go. Then one day I found myself getting on an airplane to go to New York uh -huh. to see the first Gorilla Biscuits reunion show Ooh. that, that we didn't know there was going to be more. Uh -huh. And, uh, cause my friends for the first step were yeah. playing and, uh, Rich Hall got me in. Bless you, Rich Hall. Shout out to Rich. Um, at CBGB's, uh, rip to RIP to CBGB's. Yeah. I remember being there and not being conflicted. I remember yeah. being there and being like, this is going to be the most important night of all of our lives. <laughs> and it was, it was this incredible, yeah. incredible night. Yeah. And then Gorilla Biscuits starts doing reunions and still does reunions yeah. as an artist, as a disruptor, as someone who's always kind of moving forward. Yeah. What was that like for you to do that? And what's the thinking behind it? I think I probably had a, the same attitude as you, to be honest. And then, you know, there was a, uh, the CBGBs was being like, you know, ultimately like they, they had to close down, but it was like in the name of this thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, and also just like our guys and our band and just kind of like, what a nice way to, for us to like, uh, you know, to give each other a hug and hang out with each other. You know, we always see each other and here and there, but, you know, we had kind of, scattered out a little bit at that point but yeah we went and played cbs and like the response was just like it was just like insane like i'd never experienced anything like that um and then there was just a demand for it and we had this whole tour booked and actually i tried to pull the plug on it because i was just like i don't know i just don't know if i want to like slip down this slope but it was already too far it was actually kind of a dick move for me to try to 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 do that it was just like my own anxiousness about it um, and I think over the years, it's really, I kind of look at it as it's just like a sort of a, an experience. I think like, uh, Siv once said, it's like, you know, I'm here to like, feel like I'm 17 again, yeah. you know, with all these people and like, everybody is a part of it and it's multi-generational. Yeah. Um, so it, it's some sort of like experience. It's not even really like, it's not like a band band. It's like an experience that yeah. that's how I kind of feel it and it's like a machine and the audience is all a part of it and it's just like 
uh, you know, it ebbs and flows in, 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 in some ways very, very similar, but it's always different because mm -hmm. it's always like different people and, and there's just different aspects of it. And, um, and it's really, it's been beautiful for like my friendships with my friends and, and, uh, so that's been amazing. And, um, but I would not feel comfortable just doing that. And so I, I'm still very, you know, like doing quicksand, we make new music. I've made, you know, I've done like so many records in the last, since I started doing Gorilla because I've done like, you know, six records at least, you know, of just new material mm -hmm. so that I can still, um, feel, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm with it. You yeah. know what I mean? Cause if I'm not doing it, then yeah, then you kind of do get a little stuck and, you know, I need to be passionate about something. Totally. Well, and the reason I'm asking is like, I think culturally, like punk and hardcore, very salty, very salty world, uh, <laughs> seemed to really shift. And it was like, oh, I, when Youth of Today did that kind of legendary four songs at, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was like City Gardens, mm -hmm. and you played. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh my God, that happened. Yeah. But then years later, um, Ray and Porcel and maybe Sammy, but then they got Tim Brooks to play bass because yeah. you wouldn't do it. Yeah. I always thought that was the sickest move where it was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. Cause, and was it just because you weren't into reunions at the time? I don't know what was going on at that time, but uh, I just didn't feel like doing it. Yeah. So, yeah. but that, I just didn't feel like doing it. Right. Yeah. It was like, uh, yeah, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. I remember at the time thinking, like, that's the sickest move. Cause I was in that headspace of like, oh, reunions. They're like, uh, somehow I had adopted an idea that reunions were a bad thing. Yeah. And, and I think that was kind of a general idea within, yeah. within the scene. And I'm going to pull a sidebar uh, note. I always kind of think of the sick of it all born against radio uh -huh. fight. Yeah. That, classic. Yeah. Cause I, I think it's like such an interesting idea of like, Hey man, like you can, like nobody's wrong in that. Yeah. Right. One side is the like ethical, like this is supposed to be different. Yeah. The other side is like, it is different. We just want to take it to a different platform. Yeah. Nobody's wrong in that. Yeah. Yeah. So are doing reunion show wrong, wrong reunion shows wrong. No, not at all. If people want to see it, unless people, they're bad. Right. Well, but if people love the band, they want to yeah. see it, you know, and like, I'm not even saying if it's done for the right reasons, but yeah. if like a band is important and people yeah. want to see it and the band rocks, like yeah. kills it. Yeah. Why is that bad? Flip side. Well, wait, like punk and hardcore is supposed to be about something. Uh -huh. And it creates this like weird murky ground that I think kind of punk and hardcore is maybe dealt with on its own where it's like, no, it's okay as long as the band is invested in the culture and they're yeah. kind of part of the culture. Yeah. And something that I think like really stands out around Gorilla Biscuits and, and still doing it, it and, and being able to do reunions that are like well-respected and well-loved mm -hmm. is that you are all seemingly invested in the culture still. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's amazing. Like, uh, you know, th here we are, we're grown mm -hmm. adult guys mm -hmm. And we, you know, you live in a different part of the country and I live in a different part of the country and that, yet here we are doing this kind of thing. Like that happens on so many different levels. Like mm -hmm. it's a big cultural thing for my, for my, um, you know, people my age, but it's also like expanded and grown over generations and generations. And some of them I'm ch more checked in than I am with other ones. I'm kind of a bit current these days because I was doing a show about hardcore uh, for Vans. Mm -hmm. um, over the over the uh you know kind of pandemic era mm -hmm. um and uh but this like um this sort of like uh you know people some people call it a family i think it's like a, a sort of like a society you know what i mean of people that have these sort of certain shared values and other ones that are kind of like you know takes all kinds mm -hmm. but um you know, a love of music, a love of culture. Um, I think generally like, uh, you know, people that want like, you know, fairness and, you know, people are, I think are generally on the side of good. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you a tough question. If you want to pass on it, it's totally cool. Mm -hmm. Um, when Gorilla Biscuits came back, I, I remember when you started playing show shows, mm -hmm. I was uh, watching you guys and I heard just someone beside me was like, Man, I don't remember them being this good when I saw them when I when Oh I yeah, was we got way better. Right. You became like you were all more experienced musicians. Yeah. And just we we were not I look at pictures of us or videos of us at that time and I think we were a bit uptight, to be honest. Yeah. And I think this is like absolutely like we just we are so goddamn lucky that we made this th thing with the harmonica on it and all that kind of stuff, and that people keep rediscovering it. Like it is cuckoo. Yeah. 
And so like, we're just really happy to be doing that. And like, honestly, like we're good musicians, Mm -hmm. like not like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we travel in all circles as musicians, but like really fun people to play with like musically. Yeah. And uh, we just really enjoy the hell out of it. And we appreciate like, uh, you know, like Civ can just like really engage with the audience in such a cool way. And that the, um, you know, we didn't really, I think when we played, we didn't really have, I always feel like I'm a little stiff and just trying to like project some sort of like thing. Um, whereas now we're just very much more comfortable, I think with who we are. And, and, uh, and I think that energy is, is really, is, I think people plug into it and, and, and they're also the audience is telling us in a, in a way like we're here to have fun Hell like yeah. we're in a good damn mood and well, so like that just becomes the, the mode and so you, you went right to what i want to talk about is and this is tough so if you want to push on it yeah. i'm totally cool with it i saw you with judge at like some like tattoo convention in mm-hmm. california i flew down to, mm-hmm. to go see it and it was crazy it was like a crazy show uh-huh. like a massive show i think yeah. travis barker was like his tattoo oh, yeah, convention yeah, yeah. So we're talking like real deal, big show. Yeah. Gorilla Biscuits is, is, is a incredible live band mm. at this point. You're like, good. The crowd is having the most fun. Mm. And at what point? So like young me is in my head where I'm like, I could not imagine at like 16 or 17, I'd be sitting here in California watching this yeah. crazy, amazing thing happening. Yeah. And this is like some crazy, huge tattoo festival. There's real money being made. Yeah. At what point? is the is the um the meeting ground or the crossroads between doing art and doing art just because you have fun and you want to do it yeah and making money so like how do you how do you do that in a way because you are doing something that could go on forever gorilla biscuits yeah until like the wheels fall off whatever it is but gorilla biscuits could keep playing shows forever and i think we all want gorilla biscuits to keep playing shows together how do you manage that crossroads or is that even something you even think about well, I mean, everybody's got their lives. Like, the, you know, there's kids, there's, uh, you know, other jobs and stuff like that that people are doing. So in order to, like, organize um, a show for us to play it, like, we have to have, like, it has to work out. We have to be interested in it. The money has to be there mm-hmm. uh, for it to make sense. So it's kind of easier to, like, make these choices in a lot of ways mm-hmm. because, you um, we're okay saying no. Yeah, yeah. Like if we say, if we say no to something, to be honest, that just means um, somewhere down the road, it, there's just more people will be more up for it. Yeah. If it's the worst thing we could do is say yes to more to too much stuff because then you're like kind of saturating it. Yeah. Um, and like we don't. I think what we do is super special because we kind of keep it to what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, we're playing these songs with with you know absolute we're in it hundred percent. Like my hands are just moving. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And, um, that's a very special experience. And so like we pick our spots, you know, and, uh, and I think by doing that, I think we've been pretty good to not just like, uh, burn out on it or, or, or burn other people out on it, uh, you know, cause and I can only say that because, um, you know, we get contacted for things. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, that kind of picking your spots though huh. the decision to kind of stay more of like and i'll use this term and i don't mean it in an insulting mm. way but being more of like a legacy act mm. you did one single mm-hmm. and the single at the time didn't seem like it was very well received yeah and you didn't do anything more was that based on you know what let's just keep it a legacy act because we think it's we just want to keep it simple yeah or was it we're scared to screw up our legacy i think it was a combination of things like I think we just didn't do it. There's a couple things we just missed cues. Yeah. I think on that on that single. I think the song's really good. Mm-hmm. The songs are really good, but um, I think we. Uh, I think there's a combination of things. People own the band actually, totally. and I think totally. that's that's the thing. So it's like I wanted to make something new, maybe to assuage my guilt of like doing a reunion to like be contemporary in some sort of way. But I think it was maybe just trying too hard yeah, in yeah. a way and um it should have been more considered and uh i mean whatever I, I i think it's good in the fact that it like it basically the audience said don't make any new songs dude take the pressure's off yeah 
So I think with Gorilla Biscuits, it's very comfortable to just like, this is an experience. This yeah. is like, uh, you know, it's, it's in a way it's theater, like we're, but, but you're in the, you're in the show too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that that's a very special and it's multi, like I said, it's a multi-generational connection that I think, um, you know, we weren't like in the first wave, we weren't like minor threat mm. level, but um, we we're pretty early on, so shockingly, because I thought the whole thing was over by the time we got got into it. I thought mm. we were very late. Um, so I think that's really the the thing. And to create new material when you don't need to, um, I, I don't really feel, or we don't feel um, the need to really like push that. Mm. But I think that's unique to, to Gorilla Biscuits. Whereas in Quicksand, I wouldn't feel like we felt very, very strongly that we had to like, if we're going to keep doing it, because it's it's often would be, you know, we're talking about reunions. It's mm -hmm. often to diminishing returns because everyone's really excited to see the band and then they've seen them. And then they come back six months later. It's like, oh yeah, cool. I'll go to see them. Mm -hmm. And then, then the third time they come, you're sort of like, oh, I actually am kind of busy that night. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's just the way that these things are. Um, I think quicksand really felt immediately like we wanted to be a creative entity for us to feel like we can play those songs and feel cool about it yeah. and, and to build it into the context of like who we are now. Yeah. And um, I think with Gorilla Biscuits, we are who we are now mm -hmm. in, in our, in the, in how we are on stage really. Yeah. And how we handle, ha handle the, the, the whole thing. Well, it's like Gorilla Biscuits were truly Gorilla Biscuits when you were young and you put out those records. Yeah. And then when you came back to it, you found out who you were again now, who you are now, and you just, you've become comfortable with being that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just all our personalities and our chemistry is just like, uh, it's just part of the experience. Yeah. And uh, I don't really feel like we need to make new material. And also it's like, it's almost really how I felt about it at the time when the band broke up. It's like, I just really, in on this theme, I can't really hold my ground any harder than hold your ground. You know what yeah. I mean? I think the Civ record was like a bit of, 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 of some like sort of afterburner yeah, yeah. vibe of like picking up that, that kind of character and that kind of like uh style yeah. again. But, um, I think Gorilla Biscuits shouldn't evolve. <laughs> <It> really, <laughs> we only want the evolution of to be on the T-shirt. Right? Yeah, like, like it's, it. it doesn't go. We don't want any evolution on Gorilla Biscuits, and I think that was the thing. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I think that's kind of the blueprint for a lot of hardcore. Like, it really, people. I think I hate to say it, don't want people to evolve very much. You know, uh, it, it's a weird. It's a weird culture because you can you can have people like let's say title fight how they came up uh -huh. and where they've gone and then like glitter and all those yeah. things it's like there's a hardcore audience yeah i still think like i can look at glitter and be like oh that's hardcore yeah it's not like hardcore but yeah. it comes from that perspective yes. the willingness to the willingness to innovate and stay true to yourself yeah if you're good at what you do people will follow you i, I want to touch one more thing on gorilla yeah. biscuits though um or sorry actually it's not it's not gorilla biscuits themed because i because i want to finish off with mm -hmm. quicksand and where mm -hmm. you are today um so you talked a lot about knowing your audience and like mm -hmm. with Gorilla Biscuits, you know your audience, mm -hmm. you know what your audience wants. Mm -hmm. And from like a, a commerce point of view, it's mm -hmm. like everyone's satisfied. I mm -hmm. want to go to a Gorilla mm -hmm. Biscuit show. I, I do want to hear First Failure, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I want to hear that song. Yeah. Do but we not? We play that one every one. I guess sometimes we don't. I've never seen play it. I think we switch between First Failure and uh, there's another one that's kind of exactly like it. Yeah. And we just like flip between, I think it's uh some people think oh, competition. Right. Right. Anyway, there's two of yeah. two of the songs on Start Today that we are just like they're too damn similar. We do, we play one or the other. First failure, I remember as a little kid. Yeah. That like whatever it was, whatever fit like yeah. thing I had and yeah. coming home and just being so heartbroken and looking at those lyrics and being like, I gotta like this is just a failure. It's gonna be okay. Yeah. I've never seen you guys play it, but you we know do what? play it. We do we have played it. All it's right. a fact. I I know it. If you've been led, like yes. I know, I know, I've seen Arthur on stage doing that. It's been done. Okay, um, you know your audience, and this yeah. goes back to early in the interview. Mm -hmm. Like being someone who's doing something, you gotta know your audience. Mm -hmm. Something I find interesting about your story is it's like it's like we've got a storied career. You've done mm -hmm. some considerably and continually cool things. You also aren't afraid to play in a small band. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh... I think you just, you know, 
when when you're doing gorilla biscuits, like you're just setting up a sort of a tent mm -hmm. for everyone to come in. Like yeah. it's not really like, of course, like like we're playing a pivotal role, but we're just like putting the name on the top of the thing that's yeah. going to happen, and everybody's participating. Like the reason you're going is not just to see first failure; it's because you're going to know see you're going to see that person, you're going to see that person, yeah. and you know that's the experience. Um, for me as a musician. Like I have stuff that I want to do, that I want to say, you know what I mean? Not that it's so important, but it's just like, that's what I do. So I have to like, I can't just like park up a big tent, tent on that. I still have to like break things in. I still have to um, to push these ideas and try to manifest them as best as I can. Well, Dead Heavens and Vanishing Life, mm -hmm. uh, two bands that are super cool and had like a level of recognition yeah. but certainly didn't go on to do the things yeah. that you've done with the other bands yeah. but you went out and like toured with these bands and did yeah. stuff with these bands yeah so going back to the idea of being humble you're someone who's been able to do some pretty wild things but mm -hmm. also late in your career you'll go play a record store that has like 30 people in it yeah i mean i think i i just don't see i can play both roles in a way uh, but it doesn't like I guess I have like a level of like fame and success that I'm very comfortable with in that regard because like some people couldn't do that yeah. and even if they wanted to. Um, so, you know, for me, like those kind of things will come up and, uh, you know, I get if I'm like anxious about it or something like that, then that becomes the thing that I have to put my that's my work right there. Like if, if, you know, I'm, I'm playing a festival solo acoustic in, uh, in England next week and I haven't played solo acoustic in a bit. So I'm a little like not hundred percent confident about it. So like I got, I've been starting to practice, but this week's going to be like, I got to practice. I got to go do this and I got to do my absolute best. And so that's going to occupy me. And I'm at the end of this experience, like, um, although I'm going to be like, concerned that it's not going to go as well as it could i'm in the back of my mind i know that's going to go well yeah and then i will have done something that i'm like was anxious about or um and i'll everything that i learn everything that i do to like make sure that that show goes well is going to serve me for the next bit of time you know so i'm just like building my um you know as a person you know building like my personhood mm -hmm. but as an artist um i'm i'm engaging like my, my own uh you know my talents my my uh my blocks all those kind of things was there ever a point where you had to wrestle with any parts of your personality to be able to play to a small show or to play in a band that's just kind of getting off the ground or to play to not be the main person in the band was there any because no. you said like there's work like there's never any wrestling with your ego you had to do no, I mean, I think maybe more like when you're in the wrong place, yeah. you know what I mean? If I'm feeling like, I don't feel like, like I'm in dead heavens. I remember playing like record stores and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's not glamorous, you know what I mean? But I, I don't know. Everyone's there and is excited mm -hmm. for like what I'm doing and like what I'm doing is not like, um, they're, they're, they're taking a leap over to like something that they don't really know about, you know, cause it's not like an established thing. Like for example, like dead heavens or vanishing life, like those records are awesome. You know what I mean? Like, and the bands and the people that I work with are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And those experiences like made me not only engaged me through those times, but like have like launched me to a different place and have made it more rich and interesting for me. Mm -hmm. So even those experiences where I'm like, hanging out with people in a more intimate level like yeah i i dig that like i'm not like seeking that out all the time but like it doesn't it's like i don't know it'd be pretty weird at this stage of the game be like no i mean there's certain thing i'll say no because i don't want to do it it doesn't seem fun you know what i mean like it's not like i'm jones into like play every record store in america i'm not but if it makes sense and i do it to the level of that i'm into doing it then you know I'm not trying to sell anybody on that lifestyle, but yeah, it's not, it's, I don't find that like, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't bum me out or anything like that. It, you know, and, and maybe there's some people that, um, would feel that way and not really shouldn't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know? Um, all right, let's, let's go back to quicksand now. Uh, -huh. uh quicksand has now put out what I think are phenomenal new records. It's got a new one that just came mm -hmm. out. 
it was this year, right? This, uh, this yeah. past year, yeah. yeah. Um, you already spoke to like the, the the need and the desire to keep creating, so not just to be a legacy band, to mm -hmm. be to be actually like a contemporary band. Yeah. Now that you're back, you're doing tours. I know you just announced a, a mm -hmm. tour coming up. Mm -hmm. um, what is noticeably different about the music, the business of music mm -hmm. that wasn't, or what's noticeably different from when Quicksand was initially a band and, and there was that big major label boom in the in mm -hmm. the alternative world? Yeah, I think when we're talking about business and becoming aware of it, it's like for sure like how we run our thing now because um, – you know, similar to Grill Biscuits, like we have like lives and different things that we're doing. So we have to like coordinate, like what are the things that we're going to pick and, and go do? Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas in the past on the major labels, you know, you're part of this sort of like game of like, you know, you're coordinating with their promotional teams and stuff like that. And that still exists. Like, uh, but the, the partnership with Epitaph is way more of a partnership. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're, they're in the music that they're they're on their record label for the very similar reasons that we are doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh like there's no like uh people like riding the bench, you know what I mean? Like everybody it's all hands on deck all the time. So, um you know, we pick our spots. Um we uh when we're going to do something, we get get into it and try to like max it out creatively and uh we look for ways that we could save money on doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're ethical. We pay people that work for us like well, and that we care about, uh, you know, the kind of things that we should care about, I think, you know, and we're thinking about our fans and like, what, what do, what, what is our relationship to them? And like, also like, how would we attract new fans? Because like, in a sense, like, um, we're a contemporary band, but we also just kind of have this like built in, you know, fan base, but that, that's, that's an awesome thing to have, but still you need to introduce yourself to new music. So like we prioritize, like, how do we get to do that, but do it in a way that's like, doesn't seem like too thirsty or like, or just like is a bad use of resources. Yeah. <clears throat> so that idea about being thirsty and again, for the uninitiated thirsty, meaning desperate, um, being an older band but being contemporary mm -hmm. and trying to build that relationship mm -hmm. how does someone do that because you know being an older guy that plays in like a like a straight edge band mm -hmm. like yo like a, a young kid shouldn't want to take my band out for tour their band that's popular right now mm -hmm. and is like the big band it would be almost not weird but if they hit me up and like oh i want to take change out for a tour i'd be like oh that's so nice but don't you have like friends your own age <laughs> yeah. like you're like i Building a relationship with a new audience, and especially when you're older, there's a lot of investment in playing a band. It's mm -hmm. a tricky and interesting idea, mm -hmm. but you're plugged into your audience very, mm -hmm. very well. So how do you go about that as quicksand? Well, I definitely have people that I think are, you know, have their so sort of like vantage points that, you know, that I go to for advice and get their their opinions on, on certain things to kind of like – work with my gut and like sort of like bounce off of things like that the kind of like decisions like do we do this tour do we not do this like how do we but i think the very basic level is like our relationship between the three of us to the music that we're creating mm -hmm. because like if we're really backing this music i mean there's nothing worse than like i mean luckily i've not really been in this situation but like if you're playing bullshit music and then you got to go promote promote it every night it's just got to be a nightmare oh my god um you know and and i'm not saying i'm not like being snooty about it yeah. like sometimes you just that's the way it is mm -hmm. you know what i mean and it, and then it's your challenge to get through that shitty time and and make some better music but for us it's like we're really like working on this music so like if it's the greatest music to other people or, or not to us it like represents like our best effort so like we, it behooves us to like take care of everything that we do and it also behooves us to, um, you know, we want people to hear it and and uh, be a part of this like sort of, I mean, thing with bands and you know any sort of product, I suppose, not any sort of product, but you're 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 helping to create stories. You know what I mean? There's like ancillary like uh, social reactions and 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 things that happen because you're putting forward this thing. You know what I mean? Like you're talking about the first failure or whatever like your experience with that song is like something that spins off in your life but it's like it's coming because there's these you, you know uh 
you know, we're, we're, our relationships with the songs are really good. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're heading towards the end of the, of the interview. Mm -hmm. um, I got a few questions I want to ask. The first is, uh, and again, this might be a little sensitive. Um, I want to talk about how to get the best result with a group of people. Mm -hmm. So we're going back, like when Wally sings the hits, mm -hmm. that bootleg CD yeah. came out. And I was like, oh, what? I yeah. can't believe he had to track the vocals. Yeah. Later on to go in my bands where I've had to like, unless I'm the singer, I track vocals for people all the uh -huh. time. And I went on to do that many times. It's just like, that's an understood part of it. And, uh -huh. and if you're in music, you'll understand that, that maybe the songwriter and the lyricist are actually the same thing. And uh -huh. the singer comes in and, and learns it. So as a leader in a band or kind of a creative center of mm -hmm. a band, how have you gone about getting the best takes from people and making sure that what they're bringing in isn't phoned in and actually like pushing people yeah. past their breaking point? I mean, as a, uh, I mean, I do that more as a producer and I definitely got my experience through working with Don and, and Siv uh, in GB, like that, how the conversation, how you like get the best out of each other and um, keep it fun. Cause mm -hmm. it's definitely singing is very like 3d, like playing guitar. Like I can do guitar tracks and be, of course frustrated with my my hands not doing what i want it to do yeah but singing is like way harder because there's just so much there's so much to it you know like the feeling is mm -hmm. such a, an important thing not only the execution but um you know the temper of your voice you know um all these kind of things come into play i think um you know having taste is is a thing and being able to communicate like you know, when, when I'm working with someone else, mm -hmm. like, what is it that I like about this person? Like, what is it, what, is, what is the qualities that they have that to me gets me excited? Yeah, yeah. And, um, I can remember with Siv early on his voice cracked and, uh, he didn't do that on purpose, but we were like that rules. So like, you know, we kind of like wanted that to happen here and there, yeah. you know what I mean? And so that's a thing that builds character. It's like we finding out what you like, in the other person um, helps you to draw out those kind of qualities. And like, um, and I think just being a good communicator uh, is, um, you know, to where that person doesn't feel beat by it. You know what I mean? Cause I've been in that situation too. Like someone is hearing something from me that maybe I don't even like about, you know, they're like trying to get something out of me, a part of me that I'm not willing to give up yeah. or I don't think that's a cool part of me. You know what I mean? So I'm resisting that sort of thing and um, rightly or wrongly. Mm -hmm. And so that person ha needs to kind of get a sense of that mm -hmm. and uh, come at it from a different angle, uh, try to beat me mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? It's just like that, that's, I think that's how people work with each other. And so it's like, and sometimes you just leave it alone and go to something else, maybe come back to it another time and just getting, uh, you know, it's just kind of like people skills, I suppose. Mm -hmm. These are therapist skills. Yeah, and a little so, bit. Uh, I, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a therapist by training. Uh -huh. And then by uh, trade, I'm a, a coach, a uh -huh. business coach. So what you just talked about is how I work with leaders. Yeah. And um, one of the things, because I, I think of like, someone doesn't have to be the best singer to be the best singer for that band. Oh, yeah. And if I think of like, someone doesn't have to be a natural singer. So I think I said, I think it's like, there's no one else in the world that could be the front person of that band. Yeah. That's the front person yeah. of that band. Because singing is super complex, as you said, yeah. but then singing live is different. How you engage with the crowd, how you yeah. bring people along. The guy is like iconic singer, but might not have been the most natural singer and had to get coached and mentored and yeah. led along the way until he kind of found his feet. Yeah, Getting the best results from people isn't about finding the person who's the most talented. It's the person who's most willing to play in the playground and push themselves and learn. And of course, there has to be some talent there. Yeah. But their willingness to allow that to be like molded until they can mold it themselves. And yeah. I think that like that to me is part it stands out to me as par probably why you've gone on to be able to be really strong in production mm -hmm. and help people because of some of those lessons you learned early on. Yeah, I mean, I've been on the other side of it, you know, and and you know, like where there's going to be parts of, of, of yourself that you don't really want to, to come out, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That you don't necessarily want to share with people. Um, and there's things that people are trying to project upon you. You know what I mean? That it's just like, they're barking up the wrong tree. Like that's not me, babe. You yeah. know what I mean? And, um, I hope you've said that to someone one time. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, sorry. That's not me, babe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, and, and, and that's, 
that's a point of block of a block which you want to avoid you yeah. know what i mean you don't want to when you feel a block coming yeah. you got to like sense that and kind of get away from it or maybe maybe sometimes you have to like respect somebody's like boundaries yeah. you know what i mean like there's a there's definitely a level of like um pushing someone to their be their best to like you know uh, break you know yeah not respecting people's boundaries mm -hmm. and i think you people are more likely to um take those risks when you build up trust with them oh, you know yeah. what i mean and sometimes that trust is inherent like in the fact that you've hired someone to come in and do something because you admire their work so you trust them already so you don't you, you can skip a bunch of steps but that'll break down once you get at some point yeah. usually yeah yeah um all right last three questions for you man um the first is, uh, well, actually, let's start with easy because they're going to get way harder. After okay. That. Wow. All right. So uh, the first is uh, anything that you want to hype, point people to, where can people find you? Anything that you want to share from that perspective? I'm pretty focused on uh, quicksand right now. So like anything related to quicksand, this is a, a cool band that you should check out. It's guitar, music, and uh, um, we do some kind of interesting musical passages and uh, cool rhythms and... Uh, I think anybody could kind of like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think anyone who likes guitar music, yeah. and I like that term you just used, would definitely like yeah. it, quicksand. Um, all right, second question. This is hard, but it's not that hard because you've already talked about it. Why was Captain Kirk such a great leader? Captain Kirk just, I think he knows how, he's charismatic. Mm -hmm. So he's easy to follow. He's fun to be around. Mm -hmm. um, he is. He has faults uh that that are you can see and he's not af a afraid to like make fun of himself mm -hmm. uh i think he's most he's you know he's courageous uh he's willing to take a hit for the team um he's willing to make tough decisions mm -hmm. i think the strongest quality that he has is uh how he befriends his his crew and utilizes them uh not to his own you know, because his his job is to like make sure everything kind of works out at the end, and we can everybody's alive, yeah. and uh, and he trusts his people, and he gives them the autonomy to like do their jobs. You know, they're very um, you know specialized, yet there's an intimacy there. They're not like you could have specialized departments, but there's not a connecting factor. But he is like he's. I'm sure he could go out to dinner with Scotty, have a great time. He could go out with Spock like anytime by themselves they probably have their own jokes and you know all of those guys yeah. um and I, I think he's uh definitely like my career in music i think was inspired by by star trek and i i'm down to play i think sometimes i can be kirk sometimes i'm spock uh you know i can do sulu mm -hmm. like i'm i'm i i can appreciate all those different roles i can wear a red shirt that's not my favorite <laughs> it's a dangerous shirt to wear but i can wear a blue or, or a, a mustard okay good all right man last question and uh, it, it might be easy for you it might be tough um so i could ask you a lot of music questions i'm gonna ask you a business question uh what were the three biggest mentors in your life learning how to like do the business of being a musician um, the first one that popped into my mind was Capo, although his business style is pretty cuckoo, but <laughs> I think he's probably, he's, he probably is, I'm sure he's a lot better at it now, but just that he was, if we needed, if something needed to happen, he would make it happen. Like he would find the right people, get them, put them together, shake them around, and then the thing would happen. So I think that like idea of like, um, of, of taking the initiative and seeing the uh that sometimes you just gotta like call this person call that person and it's done like yeah. why are you freaking out yeah, yeah. um i think that he's really really great at that mm -hmm. um other business people um i guess i've admired the drummers in my bands mm -hmm. like generally the drummers are always the dudes that like follow the money uh and and uh and and kind of look after that mm -hmm. um and you know there's people that have been in my bands that are businessmen like mm -hmm. siv's a businessman mm -hmm. he's does he's been doing a great business for like 20 years and uh you know i know there's a there's a lot 
you know, when you have a, a, an actual store, an entrepreneur, that there's, there's all kinds of crap that can, can happen. Um, so those, those are kind of like the people that have influenced me or, um, you know, I guess on a, a sort of, uh, yeah, my, my, my kind of like personal business, I've just kind of evolved into just taking more care of it. I think it's certainly be, probably becoming apparent this yeah. being where like money counts more. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Know, making sure shit's together. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Well, listen, Walter, this has been an awesome conversation. Anything you want to add in before we close off? Um, I hope this is uh, our conversation is of help service or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some business. It's interesting to talk about things from this, this angle. Hell yeah, man. Thanks for I having me. Dude, absolutely. It's a huge pleasure. Uh, so everyone, I'll see you in the outro. And Spencer, drop the beat. What?